Thank you, Ed. I really appreciate the invitation to be here today and especially to be in the company of so many leading intellectual property experts. I, I must say I'm not used to speaking at continuing legal education events. I also have to confess, and this may shock some of you, I'm not a lawyer. I'm the defendant. Uh, usually I'm the defendant, sometimes I'm the plaintiff, and plaintiff is more fun. Um, Public resource, uh, my organization, makes knowledge, and in particular, knowledge created with public funds or with a public purpose more broadly available. And sometimes people don't like that. So we try and clear title to this knowledge. We make it available and make the case for why we are allowed to perform this act. Access to knowledge is a human right, and the knowledge we specialize in is edicts of government, the underpinnings of the rule of law, the raw materials of our democracies. Lord Tom Bingham, the late Lord Chief Justice of the United Kingdom and one of the great jurists of our time, said there were three prongs to the rule of law. And here at Public Resource, we live in the second prong, which is promulgation. The first prong of the rule of law is, of course, that the law shall be written down and written down before the fact that we don't make up the law as we go along. We make the law first. We are, as they used to say, we are an empire of laws, not a nation of people. Well, what they said was nation of men, and what they meant was nation of white men, but you get the point. The rule of law means the law rules. The second prong is promulgation. You can't have a secret law. You can have guidelines that are perhaps restricted in view for security reasons, but that's still a written rule, but it isn't a promulgated law. When you don't promulgate the law, it can't be a law of general applicability. Uh, promulgation is where I live, and that is necessary, but it is not sufficient. It is general applicability that is the third prong. Are the laws fair, and do they apply to all equally? If women or people of color are specifically or even implicitly denied a right that is available to others, then even if you promulgate that law, you do not have the rule of law. If a lunch counter is only available to white people and not to black people, or if only males can vote but females cannot, then you do not have the rule of law. Public resource lives in between the creation of the law and the requirement of general applicability that asks if the laws are just and equal and fair and proper, if the laws reflect the society we wish to be. We live in between the sausage factory and that shining city on the hill. The middle part seems like it should be easy. The two other ends of this pipeline are certainly hard, but promulgation has proven to be hard as well. At Public Resource, we believe edicts of government need to be more widely available, not just to read, but to repeat. Our fight is not about your right to read the law. It is about our right, our collective right to speak the law, to transform the law, to better inform ourselves as citizens of our rights and of our responsibilities. Ignorance of the law is no excuse. So that's what we do. And that's led me on the road to Georgia. We look for public data that has unwarranted paywalls and terms of use and other fences and keep off the grass signs around what should rightly be part of the public domain. I say we build websites, but that isn't really our focus, though we spin several million files over a couple dozen domains that stretch back almost 30 years. Uh, we also have a YouTube channel with 100 million views and have a couple million objects up on the internet archive, including the largest library of Indian books on the internet. When we put a database up, we do the best we can given our resources and our expertise. We do a good job, but in each and every case, we don't do as good a job as could be done. But good isn't the goal. The goal is to get other people to be able to get this data and build better sites. The goal is to get the government to make that data available without restriction, because when we make every sluice of knowledge get set of flowing in all directions, that's how the information gets transformed into new and more usable and more accessible formats. Public resource is in the manumission business. 
We look for data that has public purpose and private fences. We look for examples that are so obvious, situations with such overreach that you can explain why this is nuts to a member of Congress or a member of Parliament in under a minute. Not just to elected officials, but also all the senior bureaucrats and baboos and other officials in government and to the members of the bar and to tech industry folks and to the guy sitting next to you at the bar having a beer. The edicts of government we specialize in are those that should just so obviously be available, like building codes and electrical codes and occupational safety codes. Those laws are hidden behind paywalls and copyright assertions, but they are no less law-like than any other law. Public safety codes are a situation where a private tax on access to the law has become institutionalized. It has been a big fight. We're back in the U.S. District Court now over six years of being sued by the standards cartel, groups like the National Fire Protection Association and ASTM. These are nonprofits with incredibly rich pay packages for their top executives and the real work all getting done by civic-minded fire chiefs and building inspectors and safety engineers who volunteer their time to enhance our public safety to make our world better. When the codes are adopted by government and the very purpose of these codes is to be adopted by government, then they become law. The idea that your local electrical code should only be available to you under tightly constrained circumstances, many of which require you to expend funds and use whatever brain dead user interface the code people deem to be the only way you shall read the law with significant constraints on your ability and purported right to actually speak that law is one of those one minute you've got to be kidding issues. There is an even more nuts situation. The argument the standards people make is that standards aren't really the law. They are somehow voluntary because they issue and publish them as private documents. And only after the fact are some adopted into law. Some government folks have bought into the fiction that this particular piece of the law has become the private property of profiteers. That's nuts, of course. And I don't believe that fiction for a minute, but even more nuts is when a state, a sovereign democratic state, plays that same game. Amazingly enough, there are a half dozen states in the United States of America that believe they actually do own the law, that they have copyright in the law, that they may determine the conditions upon which the law is made available. And those conditions are like the private hot dog stand in the public park. If you want a hot dog, you have to pay the designated concessionaire and you have to buy only the hot dogs that they deem worthy of your consumption at a price that they determine. They also have a sign up that says no outside hot dogs are allowed. This practice extends to all branches of government to all levels, but perhaps the most offensive is the idea that the official laws of a state, the compiled and edited laws that have been codified, that this can't be used freely. After the state of Oregon noticed Justia and Public Resource had copies of their revised statutes online, they threatened to sue. We threatened to sue back. It all worked out in the end. The Joint Committee of the House and Senate of Oregon invited us to testify. The matter was debated, and the committee voted to waive all assertions of copyright in their statutes. We had similar run-ins with other states, but Oregon was different because it was the state that was not only asserting copyright, it was the state that was doing the codification, it was the state that had the website. In Georgia, the state had made a devil's bargain. The deal was with a private organization, in this case, a company called Matthew Bender, which has, of course, been swallowed up into the gorilla that is Lexus, which is part of the even bigger elephant that is Lexus Nexus, which is, of course, part of the vast Reed Elsevier Relics universe, a state unto itself. This is a company that believes it has an exclusive license to not only the laws of a dozen states, but a vast expanse of scientific and scholarly papers and many other so-called intellectual properties that are part of what Jamie Boyle calls the second great enclosure movement. 
The deal that Georgia cut was that Lexus would do what was purportedly the bulk of the heavy lifting, all the hard stuff, the codification, and that the official code of Georgia annotated would be automagically produced by Lexus. It would save the state millions, if not 10 million, tens of millions of dollars of really, really hard work, and that it was only fair that in return Lexus would get the exclusive right to sell the laws of Georgia. This is a fiction, of course, because the Code Revision Commission is definitely in the driver's seat on this process. That's a huge part of the heavy lifting. Then they deliver the completed code over to the full legislature once a year, which affirmatively endorses it. And this is the thing that is the official code of Georgia annotated. There is a really bad, totally unusable, so-called free site with onerous terms of use and lack of accessibility and a very dumbed down, unannotated, unofficial code of Georgia. But it's not the OCGA, and even with that site, you're not supposed to actually use it according to the EULA. If you're a vendor, or anybody else that wants to put up an OCGA site, you are not allowed to play on this grass at all. Fastcase, for example, one of the best legal service providers out there is also the official provider of case law to the Georgia Bar Association. If you're a solo practitioner in deep rural Georgia, you are probably getting your legal research on Fastcase, especially since your law library is probably closed right now. Fastcase asked Georgia and Lexus if they could license the official code of Georgia annotated. They were told, and I quote, not at any price. Georgia wasn't the only one playing this game, and quite a few of the ones that were farthest out on the ledge were clients of Lexus. So in 2013, I picked a few states and bought the official codes of Georgia, Mississippi, and a few others. Now, this is not an easy thing to buy. You need to call in and get a sales rep, and we're talking a couple thousand dollars per state for the initial purpose and purchase, and you're spending another couple thousand a year to get your updates. Uh, we scanned those laws, put them up on the Internet Archive, put them on our site, sent a letter to the Speaker of the House of Georgia and various other of the good and great in the chain of command for speaking the official law in the Great Peak State, the letter was on the lines of, you know, we're sure you'll be delighted to know that the official laws of Georgia are now even more widely available. Please let us know if we can do anything to help. Just to show this was for real, since we weren't sure they actually used the internet, uh, we put a copy of the Georgia code on a peanut thumb drive and enclosed it in the letter. Uh, did the same thing for other states. For Idaho, we had ornamental potatoes, the kind of thing you'd find in a display window outside a restaurant, and we put USB drives in those and sent them on to Boise. Anyway, nobody was amused. Uh, Mississippi's attorney general sent back a really nasty letter. Uh, Georgia, likewise, they insisted that we cease, and they insisted that we desist, and we respectfully declined to do either. Each time I repeated offers to fly to Jackson and Atlanta and Boise to talk to help work through this important issue based on common goals we shared of serving the public since we were all, after all, fellow public servants. The my fellow public servants thing didn't seem to resonate. And after a few more rounds of letters, Georgia sued us in the Northern District of Georgia. Uh, they accused me of a strategy of terrorism, which was aimed to force government entities to publish documents on Malamud's terms. Uh, my wonderful lawyer, Elizabeth Rader, and the firm of Alston and Bird responded that these were bizarre, defamatory, and gratuitous allegations. So there. Calling me a terrorist was probably not a messaging strategy they cleared with PR, and the LA Times jumped all over it. Uh, terrorism makes a great headline, particularly if it is about publishing the official law, and the photo they had was of me in a suit and tie testifying before the US Congress. So we got sued. Unlike with the law firm for the venal private plaintiffs in the standards case who are paid by the hour, and so they torture us with discovery requests just for fun, with the state discovery was easy. I confessed, mea culpa, I did the deed, here's my receipts, here's my stats, let's get on with it. We were able to stipulate the key facts after a modest exchange of documents uh, in the district court I lost. No trial, summary judgment, judge just wasn't buying it. Uh, federal injunction imposed, no posting of the Georgia law by me or it'd be a trip to the big house for contempt of court. 
Elizabeth Radar had gone solo by then, and it's a huge lift to ask a solo practitioner. In fact, I didn't ask. She simply volunteered to do a court of appeal suit pro bono, but while she did it, uh, ACLU intervened on our behalf, got permission to do oral argument with us. David Halperin, who's been my of counsel since we started, pitched in big time. They let me do the amicus wrangling since I can't write briefs any better than I can code. And we had an outpouring of support. Uh, it took a year. But the Court of Appeals came down with a wonderful opinion about how the law belongs to the people and all that kind of, you know, communist propaganda that I've been espousing in my letters to the state. Uh, when Georgia asked for cert from the Supreme Court, they came in with a bunch of state attorneys general from Lexus States, of course, which I don't think was a coincidence. I asked Tommy Goldstein if his firm could represent us, and he readily said yes. Uh, Eric Citron from Goldstein and Russell worked with Elizabeth Radar and uh, David Halpern. Uh, normally, when you've won in the Court of Appeals, your job is to tell the Supreme Court that the 11th Circuit wrote a beautiful opinion, nothing to see here, let's just all move along. But the truth is, I have had to deal with this, not just with Georgia and Mississippi, but Oregon and Idaho and the District of Columbia. And the truth is, we are facing an exactly similar situation with the standards cartel. In both cases, a private party claims the exclusive right to sell the law on whatever terms and conditions they can get away with, we decided the only honest thing to say was that we welcome Supreme Court review and acquiesce to Georgia's application for cert. We told the Supreme Court we welcome their taking a look and to tell us what the rule is about what we can do and what we cannot do. Just tell us what the rule is. As with before, I was the amicus wrangler, and I'm proud to say we had 19, count them, 19 amicus briefs. Two particularly spectacular briefs were written by Shyam and Marta, who you're about to hear from. So here we are. We got a nice, strong 5-4 opinion with the five youngest justices coming in on our side. It was very across the aisle, right wing and left wing both coming in for us. So now we're trying to finish up our district court case on the standards issue, and we have similar suits on edicts of government pending in the European Court of Justice and the Honorable High Court of Delhi. I appreciate this opportunity to confess to you what I did and why I did it, and I thank you for listening.